So it's another trip to the beach. This time Bowley's Cove near Weymouth, which has got a kind of holiday park and funfair thing going on here. This time we're not in search of fossils. I've come here for seaweed. First of all, there's something else we need to do. So as you can see there's quite a lot of seaweed washed up here on the shore and seagrass and other vegetation. I'm not going to take the wet stuff because it would just be heavy to carry. So I think we'll try and pick up some drier stuff that's further up the beach. So you can see there's a sort of a reef out there, row of rocks, probably to stop the beach getting too eroded. And there's quite a lot of seaweed, that's where all the seaweed's growing, or that's the nearest bit to the beach. So from here we can see the town of Weymouth the island of Portland and then over there we've got Lyme Regis and Charmouth and eventually Kimmeridge and all of those sorts of places and so you can see again there's the Kimmeridge formations there the uh, the cliffs that are eroding not quite sure is that golden cap up there or is it further around not sure anyway so that's in terms of the location where we are I haven't picked up any seaweed yet because we're just going to go for a little walk along the beach here and we'll pick up the seaweed on our return leg so that we're not carrying more than we need to. I had it in mind we would just pick up a lot of this stuff as we walk along but actually there's a spot further up on the beach where we first came to on the way in where it's all concentrated so I might as well go and pick it up from there I think. Now some of you might be wondering am I allowed to collect seaweed from the beach? Uh, short answer, yes I am. Slightly more complex answer. There aren't any really hard and fast written rules about it. The Crown Estate says you can collect small amounts of seaweed for personal use, but that's talking about picking live seaweed from rocks and things. There is actually almost nothing said about picking up dead seaweed and rotting seaweed from the foreshore, or from the upper shore rather, and the strand line for use in gardens. So this is going to be one of those things where it's a renewable resource. The right and proper thing to do is take a, a small reasonable amount for personal use. So yeah as we get up here there's more and more of this seaweed and so this is what I have some of this in the bag. In fact, I think further along it was all kind of shredded up and starting to decay anyway already, so we might take some from there. We have, of course, brought an extra bag for bits of plastic waste that we can pick up along the way. There's not a lot of it, I'm happy to say. It's actually a really, really clean beach. The rubbish. So yeah, these areas along here seem like the best place to pick it for several reasons. One, it's a lot more broken down here it's really smelly and kind of rotting here which is means that half the composting has already been done for me up here on the top of the shore as well the tide doesn't come up this far so this will have had a lot of the salt washed off it by rain and and also this smelly rotting seaweed here is probably a little bit of a nuisance to the people who are going to use this beach later in the season so not that my picking up of seaweed is going to make a massive difference, but if I'm going to do it from anywhere, I might as well do it somewhere where I'm not increasing a nuisance, I'm slightly diminishing it. So yeah, this is the stuff I'm going to go for, and as you can see, it's already kind of partly rotted down. So yeah, this stuff here is ideal because you can see it's already almost turned to soil on its own. So we've got two sort of three-quarter sacks of stinky disgusting rotten seaweed. Let's get that back to Shrimp Cottage and get it on the garden. Now in comparison to the manure that we're also going to spread on here, there's not very much seaweed, but this is more like a little tonic for the soil. Would have been really nice if we could have collected enough to, to really cover this up.
well rotted manure. One of the hazards, of course, of bringing back seaweed from the beach is fishing line. However, I suppose it's good that we got it off the beach. Okay, I've got here some seeds for wall pennywort. This is a plant that grows on walls and rocks, Umbilicus rupestris. Umbilicus means navel. Repestris means growing on cliffs or rocks. This is an edible plant. I've eaten it before. I haven't actually had it for many, many years, but I've got a, I think I've got a page for it on my old website. And I wanted to grow this at Shrimp Cottage here. We've got a number of walls in the garden. They've got nice little crevices that something like this would grow in very nicely. And I was kind of surprised we haven't got it here already. But anyway, I'm gonna plant some. I think I've got about 100 seeds here. They're tiny little seeds, almost like dust. I think the advert said at least 100 seeds. I reckon there's probably 500 in there, to be honest. Okay, I'm gonna do two different things today. I'm gonna to plant some in a little tray of compost. So this is just a plastic tray from, I think we had some mushrooms in this and I've just filled it up with potting compost. This is a peat-free multi-purpose compost, so it's good for seeds and growing plants. It's got John Innes blend in it, which means it's got some soil in there as well as the organic sort of substrate, the rotted bark or whatever they make this stuff out of. That soil content is actually quite good for seeds and so on because it helps to wet the compost it means the compost doesn't get that thing where it dries out and can't get wet again but it also um, helps to sort of retain moisture and it will provide some minerals and things that the plants probably need for growing so I've just got one of my old scripts here so I'm just going to take some of these seeds carefully open the packet now I've got to be careful the seeds don't all get stuck on this glue that's holding the packet shut. A little grease proof sort of packet inside. So there's no glue on that bit there. So I'll dip out some of those seeds. That's probably enough. I have got a plan for what I'm going to do with some of the others. I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, and then I'm going to distribute these seeds just by tapping the paper. Going to kind of try and distribute them fairly evenly over the surface of this compost. Probably not making a great job of that. Okay. And I think what I'll do, just to try and distribute them a bit more, is I'll just give that a little jiggle. That will help to cover up some of these seeds. They're tiny seeds, probably means they don't need to be deeply buried. However, this is a plant that favours growing in rocks, in crevices in rocks. So it might be that this needs covering up in order to germinate. It might, need, it might be that the trigger for germination on this thing is that it finds itself in a damp but dark place. Seeds are funny like that. They have different triggers for what will break dormancy. And usually those triggers are related to the kind of environmental conditions that the plant requires. Anyway, so that's that. That's going to need a little bit of water on it. And I need to cover it. So I've got this other little punnet which came from grapes, I think. It almost fits. And I think we can probably just make that into a, a tiny propagator by use of a couple of little bits of tape. Pretty good. I'm not very worried that it doesn't completely seal it. It's got ventilation holes in the top. You don't actually want 
to completely cover and hermetically seal something like this because that will just get it too damp and that can encourage the growth of molds. This has got enough space there for air to get in and for the seeds to be able to breathe but also there's enough cover here to stop that drying out too quick. I'll go and get some water. Okay just a little bit of water and not really necessary to do it like this but I thought it might be best just to water it with a little pipette like this just so I can make sure I'm not washing anything away, not splashing it too much and so that I can really carefully dose the amount of water that I put on there. The compost was slightly moist already so it won't need very much. It's important not to overwater seeds because they will just rot. Okay so I think that's probably enough and now I'm just going to cover that up just to make sure I don't forget what's in there. So I'll put that in a warm place and we'll keep an eye on it. But I'm going to plant some more of these seeds in a moment. So to take a sort of belt and braces approach, I'm going to plant some of these directly in the walls. This is just a little bit of the same compost I've got in a pot that I happen to have saved. Now, let's get some more of these seeds out. That's probably enough. I will save a few just in case nothing happens at all. So we've got enough seeds to have another try at this. And these seeds, I'm going to mix them in to that compost. Hopefully that's nicely and evenly mixed and those seeds are now distributed through that compost. So now I'm going to go and plant this directly in the crevices in the walls that we looked at earlier. There we go, and I did have an excess of that compost mixed with seeds, so I've planted some of it along the top of the walls as well. Because this plant will grow in kind of rocky soil and it'll scramble over there if it grows. So now all we can do is wait and see what happens. And I'll provide updates in future Random Stuff episodes. Today I went for a walk along Sea Town Beach. What is the name of this place? Uh, sea? Town? Now I didn't go specifically to look for fossils, in fact I went to record a slow TV episode and so I didn't look for fossils at all on the entire outbound leg. I wanted to have a kind of uninterrupted walk along the entire beach from Sea Town to Golden Cap. So I didn't look for fossils on the way, but on the way back along the beach, on the return leg, I did just keep my eyes open and I found three really lovely fossils. So the first one is this Bellum Knight. And what's really nice about this is it's just a really nice big one and it's actually quite complete and intact. So it's just a really nice big bellum knight, not a bullet. The second one I found was this beautiful, beautiful ammonite, pyrotized ammonite. So this has been infilled with iron pyrite, which is what gives it this lovely golden luster. And that's possibly the best ammonite specimen I've ever found here in Dorset. I'm not going to say that's complete because obviously we don't know how much more of a spiral there was when that was a living animal. But what's nice about this is it's not broken. It's not broken in half. It's a complete spiral from, well, you know what I mean. But yeah, and it's also in lovely condition. Got a nice pyrite luster, which I hope will be persistent. And I found this, which is a piece of crinoid stem. So when you look at the end of it, you can see it's got a kind of five-fold symmetry. I'll get some close-up photos of all of these. And you can also see it's got a kind of segmented look to it. And these things break up into little flat pieces 
which are sometimes called fairy coins, I believe. But there you go, that's a crinoid stem. I found a lot of these at Sea Town and elsewhere on the Jurassic Coast, but I think this is possibly the nicest one I've ever found. So that's my three fossils, and I found these on the foreshore, and I still maintain that the best fossils, the best finds, are on the foreshore, not things you can dig out of the cliffs. Certainly the fossils, if you try and dig in the cliffs, which a lot of people were, they were tappy-tapping away at the cliff with hammers and whatnot, certainly the fossils in the cliff are more numerous, but the fossils you find on the foreshore are typically better quality. Why is that? Well, because some quite large percentage of the fossils in the cliff are not very durable. And if you just cut them out or, or chip them out, you'll find that over time, as they dry out and oxidize, they just crumble away to nothing, unless you've got the means to actually stabilize them. So some high percentage of the fossils in the cliff is like that. So as those fossils naturally erode out of the cliff, most of them are just destroyed and become part of the beach, become sand or mud or whatever as part of the beach. The ones that survive are the ones that don't do that. On the foreshore, you typically find the better specimens because those are just the ones that have survived the erosion process. It's a bit like buying secondhand furniture. You can get the impression sometimes that they used to make better furniture in the old days, but actually all it is is the pieces of furniture that have survived this long have done so because they were well made. So it's kind of a selection bias thing going on. It's not that the better fossils somehow migrate to the foreshore, it's that all of the fossils migrate to the foreshore, only the better ones actually stay there for any amount of time. Okay, well here's an interesting thing. I went and took those detailed photos and my eyes are not what they were. That's not the interesting part. My eyes are not what they were and, and they weren't great even then. But when I zoomed in on those detailed photos, I saw that you can actually see the detail of the suture lines from the shell. The suture lines being the lines between the successive segments of shell as this organism originally grew itself from a tiny little larva to a well more adult specimen. So each of these little segments was joined with a new piece of shell joined onto the previous one. And the lines between it are called suture lines. And in ammonites, they're quite often like dendritic or fractal in nature. So I thought we'd get the microscope out, the USB microscope, and get a closer look at that. And while we're at it, here's some close-up footage of that crinoid stem as well. The weather's starting to warm up now and these are my seed potatoes that I'm going to plant out this year. I've got three varieties here. This is pink fir apple. This one's called Nicola. I forget the name of this one. I'll put it on the screen right now. So what I'm doing with these potatoes is chitting them, which is just to put them like this in an old egg box, just to stop them rolling around and keep them in one orientation. And I've left them in a light but not direct sunlight position so that they're starting to form shoots and buds. So these will be ready to plant out fairly soon. As long as we're past the worst of the frosts, these will be okay to go in the ground. I have got one more variety of potato I'm going to grow this year, but they're not proper seed potatoes. Potatoes are kind of an open source vegetable. That is, if you buy potatoes from the shop, you can just grow more potatoes from them. Not always the best idea because the difference is these seed potatoes have got guarantees with them, not like they're certified to be grown from virus-free stock. But that kind of thing's more important when you're growing a whole field of potatoes than it is just growing a few potatoes in your vegetable plot. So, I happened to be up in my old neighbourhood the other day and I popped into M&S where they had some speciality potatoes. And so I've bought three of these. These are blue potatoes. So I won't cut them in half now, obviously, because that would destroy them. Although you can cut these up, by the way. That's the other thing you can do when you're planting these out. You can cut that in half. And as long as there's a bud, as long as there's an eye on each piece, you can grow two potato plants from one potato, two or more, if you cut them several times. I'm not going to be doing that, I don't think. I think I'll just plant these whole. Anyway, these are blue potatoes. And if I was to cut these in half, you'd see inside, they're kind of like a dark purple color. 
and depending on how you cook them they will either stay a dark purple colour or they go navy blue. If you slice them thinly and fry them they will tend to go like a dark navy blue. If you've got alkaline water like hard water and you boil them they tend to go blue rather than purple. It's like an anthocyanin I think the pigment in these so it's like a pH indicator if it's in the presence of acids it's pinkish purple if it's in the presence of alkali it's bluish green. So anyway those are my blue potatoes and as I say open source because these are just potatoes I bought from the grocery shop but they're alive and so if I put these in here which I will do by the time we come to plant these out in a week or two there'll be shoots on those as well and so I'm going to be growing some blue potatoes this year. It was also quite an economical way of buying them. I was surprised but those speciality potatoes, these three speciality potatoes, cost me 19 pence. So actually, I could have even had those on a budget challenge. Anyway, that's my seed potatoes for this year. We'll be planting these out fairly soon, so probably in the next Random Stuff video, you'll be able to watch that happen. About a week has passed and we've got germination of these pennywort seeds. I don't know if you would see this very well on the camera, but there are lots and lots of tiny, tiny little green specks in here. When we look at them closely, they are tiny little pairs of leaves. Now we do have some other things in there which you might see as well, which are like little beige blobs, which I think are some sort of tiny cup fungus. I'm not going to worry too much about that. The plants seem to be doing okay. So there's not too much to do at the moment, except to just cover these back up again. And we'll leave those on the windowsill, let them grow on. When they're big enough, we'll better prick them out and put them into pots and grow them on. This is a tiny little revisit. I'm just here to visit my daughter um, today. This is where I walked, do you remember I walked the railway track from Botley to Bishop's Waltham? And I was speculating if this aggregate that's making up this path here is recycled railway aggregate and wondering whether any of the materials from the old railway had been kind of reused in this farm when the railway was dismantled and I walked right past these railway sleepers without even noticing them and without commenting on them and these are old concrete railway sleepers similar sort well probably the same sort as the ones we did see in situ down at the Botley end of the line. So there we go. There is evidence still here of the old railway track. It's the comment positivity section where I will just pick a half a dozen comments or more that either uplifted me or encouraged me or asked an interesting question that I want to answer or perhaps just made an observation or a funny dad joke. So reading glasses on and let's begin. On the cake spear video, don't know if this counts as a dad joke or just a very very clever pun much ado about muffin i just <laughs> i wish i'd i wish i thought of that for the title of the video i still might steal that and change the thumbnail um on the tiny breakfast video i think you need to unbox some quail scissors and back when i owned quails i bought a quail egg cutter very similar to a cigar cutter you just slice off the top and dump the egg out of the shell i had no idea that quail egg scissors were a thing i have got a bit of a utensil fetish as you may already have noticed um, but I'm not sure I'm going to buy some because actually I don't buy quail eggs all that much but what an interesting thing. So um, on the budget challenge videos lots of people uh, lots and lots of comments about that but uh, one in particular failure is interesting. I don't think these challenges have to succeed to be entertaining to watch however you could just increase your budget. I think most people agree on that. The fun of the series is seeing what you can manage to make with a limited amount of ingredients. Um, Good point. Actually, failure is interesting. Watching other people fail, not just entertaining, but actually can be instructive. And yes, I, I'm not going to abandon the series, so don't worry about that. Somebody suggested, could you open the beans and mash some to bind the veg? That's a really good idea. Do you know what? In that budget challenge with that stew pack of vegetables and beans and mushrooms, I probably for the first time in any of these challenges really, really got stuck. And I don't think it helped that there wasn't sufficient... Uh, calories in all of that bunch of food there to sustain me. I think my brain kind of went into a bit of a uh, low energy mode and I wasn't thinking at my best really in all of that. So that's an interesting factor really actually is that if you don't have enough 
calories and energy to keep your brain going, the whole creativity with the ingredients becomes a much harder task, perhaps impossible. Now the reason this one in particular failed, I think, is because I got fixated on having fresh vegetables. Uh, two, I made two mistakes. One, I went to shop in Morrison's, where I'm not really familiar with the store, although I do like Morrison's, but I'm not very familiar with the store layout, what's cheap and what's not cheap in, in general in their store. They also have very, very little loose vegetables. So you can't buy three carrots, you can only buy a kilo of carrots or maybe half a kilo. You can't buy one onion, you can only buy a kilo of onions. And so my choices were suddenly limited down to either having that stew pack and having the selection of vegetables they wanted to give me in there, or having no vegetables at all, or having a kilo of the same vegetable, which is probably more than I needed for the day. So it, that was a big factor in the kind of fail. Looking back on it, I think what I should have done is just probably forgotten about the fresh veg and gone off and bought something else, tin tomatoes a pack of pasta, a tin of tuna, or something like that, maybe. I don't know. I should have looked elsewhere in the store rather than fixating on fresh vegetables. That's an awful thing to have to say because I do believe that fresh vegetables are really good for you. So that's kind of defeat in its own right. But I think I got tunnel vision on the fresh vegetables and I was trying to solve the problem in a way that I wanted to solve the problem rather than finding the solution that was going to work. Anyway, I'm going to revisit that challenge. In fact, by the time you're watching this, I may already have done so. That might have been yesterday's video. But anyway, I'm going to revisit that challenge with exactly the same parameters and rules. Perhaps a different shop. Perhaps I'll do it twice. Perhaps I'll do it once in a different shop and once again in Morrison's, but with a different mindset. One of the things that people have said quite a lot in this budget challenge is, some, is stuff like this. Can you do one that's a day's worth of government assistance? Either the UK version of food stamps or maybe the equivalent of what you get from a food pantry. So a, a lot of people wanted me to make this more realistic. And I'm really cautious about that. I've prepared what I want to say here so that I don't foul this up. I answered this comment saying I think it would stray too far in the direction of emulating real world situations of genuine hardship. Which is something for this series that I've always tried to avoid. But I think I do need to rethink my position on that. Most importantly, I don't want to be preaching to people who are experiencing genuine hardship about how I think they should spend their money. My life is comparatively easy right now. It hasn't always been that way, but I'm absolutely certain that there are people, lots of people in the world, who are in worse places than I've ever been in. And I'm just aware that there seems to be a never-ending stream of privileged boneheads bloviating on how the poor could get by if they just got used to eating turnips or worked a little bit harder. I never want to join that group of people. I never want to become that person who from a position of privilege and comfort dictates how easy it is to be poor. On the other hand, it's clear to me from the feedback in the comments that people on tight budgets have found bits and pieces of my videos useful or inspiring. And I'm really happy about that, but it will never be my place to prescribe to people in situations much worse than my own how I think they could better spend their money. But without ever doing that, I think I can, within the scope of the Budget Challenge video series, explore some more realistic types of frugal shopping and cooking, just hopefully without being patronising about it. So the plan going forward for the budget series is firstly repeat the last challenge with exactly the same rules and parameters. Have another go, get back on the horse. I know I mentioned giving up as a possibility but actually that's really more to do with my background in project management where do nothing is one of the things you always list on the options. Just really because that provokes an interesting discussion about why you should do something. Nextly a different thing. So what I want to do actually is go shopping without a budget. So still have a challenge where the challenge is just be frugal and try to create a three meals for a day with minimal waste and minimal excess and just go for a frugal shopping basket. And then we can actually try to see how that price is out. We can see what level price wise is the boundary between impossible or really difficult and actually more easily possible if you like. So rather than actually setting a budget and then trying to fit into it I will just try and keep things paired to the bone but decent and we'll see what price that comes out at. And then another idea, larger budget but still tight. So like £10 for 10 days or £15 for two people for seven days but only publish three episodes of that. 
making 10 days worth of content, 10 days worth of three meals a day video budget challenges is just far too punishing a schedule and I don't intend to put myself through that. It's not just the cooking, it's positioning the camera, it's the planning, it's the recording of the nutritional analyses, it's everything. It gets to be too much. So I think what I'll do is actually set, say, a £10 budget for 10 days, go and buy all of that shopping, make three days worth of interesting meals out of the stuff that I've got but at the end of episode three I have to show to you a meal plan with how the remaining parts of that thing will be rationed and used and what the actual meals I'll create and the ingredients I'll require to create it so I've got to kind of make it credible but I don't intend to trouble you by making you watch a 10-day series there are other things to explore in this series as well for example I've always ruled out pro rata use of bulk ingredients I've always said okay it's not acceptable in the rules to buy 10 kilos of rice and use 50 pence worth of it. But why? Why not? Why don't we explore that? Why don't we actually do a thing, maybe I should set that as a rule where I say actually all of the things have to be bought in bulk at the cheapest possible prices and then I have to price out one day's worth pro rata. So perhaps that's another way to do it. And all of these different ideas are kind of as well as rather than instead of. So anyway, not going to give up on the budget challenges, more of those to come. Next, the needle felting video. Just lots and lots of lovely, supportive, constructive, helpful, encouraging comments on that video. Too many comments to show them all here. That truly was what I hoped for out of that video, was to sort of make my own little bumbling start without very much expertise or research, and then get advice and suggestions from people who know what they're doing. And the plan worked. It was really, really constructive, really helpful. I really just want to thank everyone who contributed to the body of advice and support and encouragement that accompanied that video. It was just really heartwarming. Next, an interesting fact about flatbreads that I didn't know. On quite an old video, just now found this video as I was going through your channel. Khobez, which is a, I think a Turkish style flatbread, has two sides, a brown and a white side, and they're usually separated into two separate rounds. The brown one is usually more intact and better for wraps and sandwiches, and the white side is for dipping and scooping. And I had noticed that with those uh, with those flatbreads that they are a little bit more crunchy on one side a little bit softer on the other so an interesting fact thank you for that back on the felting video again quite an important PSA that bears repeating if you're ever out walking and you see a sheep lying on its back chances are it's stuck on its back and it needs help to get back up again sheep obviously are domesticated animals and they're built differently from their wild ancestors and Unfortunately, there are situations where they can fall over and roll onto their backs, especially when they're heavily pregnant, I think, and they can get stuck there. And after only a very short time, like a couple of hours of being stuck on their back, they will die because of the lack of blood flow and constrictions to their respiratory system and sorts of things like that. So if you ever see a sheep lying on its back out in a field and when you're out walking, the farmer almost certainly wants you to help that sheep get back on its feet. And apparently the way to do that, I will link to a video that gives full details about this, but essentially it really is just a case of going and grabbing hold of a couple of its legs, and the, probably the legs furthest from you, and pulling, so that the sheep can get back up onto its feet. They'll often, if they've been there a while, I think, take a while to recover and get back up on their feet, but getting them back the right way up, even if they're on their knees, is essential. So, little thing that I only learned comparatively recently, if you're out walking and you see a sheep on its back, please do try to help. Also, there have been lots and lots of really supportive and encouraging comments from people uh, just wishing us well in the new house, hoping that we've settled in nicely. We have, we've started to settle in now. It really does feel like home here. Um, and I think what we'll do now is we'll just go out and have a look. There's a few things to have a look at in the garden. I've been enjoying watching the garden come to life. I don't know everything that's out there, but so far out in the garden we've had some lovely crocuses come up, we've had snowdrops, and a few other interesting little surprises. And I'm just really looking forward to more of the same, because this was a mature garden when we moved in, and so there are all sorts of things out there to discover for us as they come to life during spring. Let's go and have a look at that now.
And so finally, also on the felting video, but about the channel in general, someone said, wow, you put out so many videos in such a small amount of time. I'm certain that you hear this quite often, but I really appreciate the variety in your videos and the effort you put into them. Thank you for that. So about the uh, publishing schedule. If we go back maybe three years, I was publishing about one video a week if it was ready. Some weeks nothing at all, occasionally two videos a week and occasionally there would be like a two or three week gap between videos if there was something big happening or if I was just busy doing something else and getting and finding not enough time to edit the videos. When I quit my IT job and went full time on YouTube I started being able to guarantee one video per week and so I started putting out a video every single Friday at five o'clock UK time. Then it went to a publication schedule that was always a Friday video sometimes a Saturday video and very occasionally a Sunday video too. And then over time I kind of fell into a pattern of always doing three videos every week without fail, which I can still do. There's never been a shortage of video ideas. In fact, quite the contrary. The list of ideas always grows faster than my ability to make videos about them. But producing three videos a week has changed things a bit. The requirement to put all that editing and production time in actually imposes limits on the sort of videos I can make. They have a tendency to be the smaller things that I can start and finish in a day or two. I think it's time for a subtle change in order to make slightly longer or more complex things possible. So here's the plan. I am, as of now, dialing back to two videos a week. The main video on Friday, as at present, and this will be on the usual wildly random assortment of topics, or indeed new topics as they arise. Variety is still the only thing I know how to do. And then there'll be a second video on Saturday, which will often be more, one of the more laid back sorts of video. So maybe slow TV or a nature ramble or a bit of unscripted experimentation in the kitchen or weaving a basket or the monthly random stuff videos like the one you're watching now. Sort of weekend stuff with a more relaxed and laid back feel. There may still be times when I want to put out three videos in a week, but only probably if it's something that's time sensitive such as a warning about a new scam doing the rounds, or if it's something related to a calendar event like Pancake Day, which I didn't do a video on because I never put a video out on Tuesdays. So that third video might land on any day, either as soon as it's ready or when it's very relevant. I very much want this to become a focus on higher quality of videos instead of just greater quantity. And I hope you'll see that happening over the next weeks and months. So thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.